Can I just sort of say well done to the parents that have got the kids in? Um, because normally we'd have kids' activities and they'd be out for two five niners. Can I say well done, parents? Can I also say well done, kids? Um, and, uh, nobody expects, if you're five, six, or under, or whatever, for you to be absolutely silent. So parents don't feel hassled by it, because you can do. I, I know how many services I went to, and trying to keep the children quiet and content uh, just takes all your mind and thought. So uh, don't worry about it too much. Um, you can always hit that. You can always um, uh, gently persuade them in all sorts of ways. Uh, and if you need to, you can slip out. I know it says no entry over there. You can slip out in there, and they can be quiet in there because it's, it's not so easy in there. Um, thank you for the worship. Thank you for the time that we've spent together. I know it is slightly frustrating, isn't it, because you can't sing. Uh, but at the same time, it is good to be together. And it encourages me to see others that want to sing as much as I want to sing, uh, even though we're not singing. And it encourages me to be part of the service. Uh, thank you for those who have joined us online. I think it's an encouragement to be here, uh, so I do think you're missing out a little, but I can understand if, if, if because of fear or because of illness or whatever, you're joining us online, and we do welcome you, so thank you for that. Let's pray before we look at these verses from Acts 4. Father God, we come to your word with a desire to understand it and to, by understanding it, to know you better. Help us, we pray, to do that. Amen. We, if you've been here the last few weeks, you know we're going through the, the book of Acts, um, and today we're looking at Acts chapter 4, and uh, the title is A New Persecution. As we look at the chapter, it's worth remembering that the church at this point is just a few days or weeks old, and these first Christians are facing persecution. In the verses that we've read today, verse 3, Peter and John are seized and jailed uh, for what? For preaching the message of Jesus, the fact that he's, he's risen from the dead. Persecution then features, if you read the book of Acts, carry on through, it, appe it, it appears in um, all but two of the next 24 chapters of Acts. And virtually all the key players in the book of Acts... Uh, face persecution. All the disciples, uh, not all mentioned in Acts, but the disciples are crucified, beheaded, run through, according to Bo Fox's Book of Martyrs. The author of the book of Acts, Luke, is hung. Paul and Barnabas, again, who are key players later on in the book of Acts, are imprisoned and executed. In fact, by the end of the first century, the word for witness in Greek, and the word for martyr in Greek, which is the Greek word martus, were the same word. In other words, if you were going to be a witness for Jesus in the first century, it, it was virtually automatic that you were going to be martyred for that. And that's why the one word that became, by the beginning of the first century, meant witness, by the end of the first century, meant martyr. 2,000 years have gone on, and, and over those 2,000 years, everywhere where the, the message of Jesus has been faithfully presented, the church have faced persecution. But let's look at what's happening here. If you've got your Bible, keep it open at Acts chapter 4. Um, if nothing else, it keeps you awake to, to have your Bible in front of you and looking at it. Um, what's happened in chapter 3? A lame man has been healed by Peter. He's, he's obviously a well-known figure. He sits outside the temple gates, the te temple gate beautiful. Worshippers pass by this fella. And this action of Peter healing and restoring this man back to health has created a stir in Jerusalem. And it gives Peter the opportunity then to, to speak to the crowds. And Peter uses the miracle of this man and the Old Testament to demonstrate to the people there that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. Now, I've got three simple thoughts that kind of guide us through this passage. And um, hopefully, I mean, if you read the passage, you can understand what's going on. But hopefully these thoughts bring out points that we don't perhaps at first notice. Or maybe they just reinforce them as we do notice them. So let me just, talk. the first thought is this. First thought is, is the willful unbelief of the leaders. The willful unbelief of the leaders. 
There's a, there's a well-known story. I've, I've certainly used it before in talks and probably used it here. There's a little boy in the back of the car, and he's in his little car seat, and he decides, as Dad's driving along, uh, maybe he's on the motorway or something like that, he decides, I don't want to sit in my car seat anymore. And I can remember this from Daniel and Emily. I can remember pushing their stomachs down as they stood rigid. Push them down, get them in the car seat. feel like child abuse, but he's not. It's not, it's not. You're just trying to get them in to keep them safe. Anyway, this little fella decides he's not going to sit in his car seat anymore. He decides he's going to stand on the back seat and look out the window. So he climbs out. In the middle of a journey, he climbs out. And Dad, first of all, gently tries to bribe him back into his seat, as you do. And then he, he kind of gets a bit firmer and tells you, you've got to get back in that seat. And then he starts to warn him, and then he starts to threaten all sorts of punishments. And the little boy goes, no, I'm standing up. So he stands on the back seat. And in the end, Dad says, look, if you do not sit down in your seat, I am going to have to put you in your seat. I'm going to have to stop the car and put you in the seat. And the boy thinks, I'm not sitting down. So the dad pulls over, and he, he, he basically grabs the little boy and wrestles him back and gets him into the seat and straps him all back in and says, you are staying there. And then as they dry off, drive off, the little boy says to his dad, I may be sitting down on the inside, but on the outside, uh, sorry, I may be sitting down on the outside, but on the inside, I am standing up. <laughs> We're all aware of willful disobedience, aren't we? I mean, if you don't, any parents are well, you know, and we've all been kids as well, so we, we know from both ends, probably, or many of us know from both ends. Willful disobedience. But there's also willful unbelief. It's a bit more subtle. When we choose, despite all of the evidence, not to believe, because believing maybe has consequences, or believing is going to be costly, so we choose deliberately, willfully, not to believe. And I think that is what's going on here. Willful unbelief from the religious leaders as they are and as they see what Peter does in front of them. It's an old quote, but somebody said the words, most people's minds are like concrete, all mixed up and permanently set. And I think there's a level of truth in that. Sometimes it does take almost an explosion to break in because we are willfully not believing or willfully won't believe. It doesn't matter what evidence Peter and John present to these religious leaders. They, they seem to just want to reject it. If you read the verses in verse 5, Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, and other family members of the high priest's family are there. You've got the elders and the teachers of the law. You've got the Sadducees. And they are calling Peter to account. These people who rejected Jesus are now going to reject Peter and the resurrection as well. Right, right in front of them, they've seen three things. And I want to put these three things to you. They've seen three things. One, they've seen the Old Testament come true. They've seen uneducated men teaching with incredible power. And then they've seen a man healed, and he's standing right there in front of them. And yet still, they're going to reject. Just look at verse 11. This is Peter. He tells them, first of all, he points to the Old Testament. And he says, look, the Old Testament is coming true in front of your eyes. In fact, you're part of it. And he says this. Uh, verse 11, Jesus is, this is Peter talking, Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. He's using a verse from the Old Testament, and he's saying, you have rejected the Messiah. He's the stone that the builders rejected. That was the prophecy in the Old Testament, and you're the ones that have done it. Now, he presents this to them, first of all. Then they have the witness of these uneducated men, verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized these were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these main men had been with Jesus. Uneducated men were now teaching and doing it with incredible power. And these Pharisees, these leaders, leaders, these, um, I should say, religious leaders, these religious leaders see these uneducated men, and the verse says they were astonished. 
they realized that these men had been with Jesus. And they thought, how can, how can you argue like this? How can you present like this? And yet they could. These men had been, I love that line, these men had been with Jesus. And it had had such an effect on them that they are now standing in front of people. In other words, those three years of being with Jesus, so much had rubbed it had transformed. Now, it wasn't just that, but this is what the Pharisees, the, the, um, sorry, the religious leaders noticed. They noticed that these men had been with Jesus. They didn't know that there was also another element to it. And it's mentioned in the verses previous. These men had also now got the Holy Spirit within them. And with the Holy Spirit within them, and the fact that they'd spent so much time with Jesus, they were standing there as uneducated men, but able to absolutely knock the socks of, the, of these religious leaders, leaving them astonished. And then add to that, not only have these men, Peter and John, taken the Old Testament, not only are they teaching just like Jesus taught, but add to that, the man that was healed is standing right there in front of these religious leaders. Verse 14, but since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. It was most likely that this beggar had been begging on, 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 on at the gate for, for, for years. We're told later he's in his 40s. It's most likely that they know that this is completely undeniable as a miracle because they had seen the man there for years and now he was able to stand in front of them. They saw it with their own eyes. So Peter and John use the Old Testament. They're, they're educated men who suddenly have, are inspired and moved to speak like this. And then, as well as that, there's a man healed standing right there in front of them. Now, this left the religious leaders astonished, we're told, and speechless, we're told. Look how they react in verse 16. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they've performed a notable sign. And we cannot deny it. But they're going to deny it. Well, they're not actually, it's more, they're going to ignore it. Winston Churchill said this. At least it's attributed to Winston Churchill. It's one of those quotes that everybody thinks he said. Men occasionally stumble over the truth. Most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing has happened. I think that happens a lot. I think that's what's happening here. They have stumbled upon the truth. But they are going to deny it. They are going to reject it. Even though they themselves say in verse 16, we can't deny it. So the first thing I just want to point out to you in these verses is the willful unbelief of these religious leaders. But then I just want to apply it. I think we're all capable, very capable, of high-level willful unbelief. I don't think it's uncommon to respond to the message of Jesus, to the facts of the resurrection. resurrection. I'm talking facts, I really am. The facts of the revelation, uh, the, the resurrection. And actually to walk away rejecting it. I remember Roger Carswell telling the story of a lecturer that he spoke to. Again and again he talked about the, the, the Christian message, he talked about the gospel. And in the end he, he asked the lecturer, you know, well, what, what he thought. And the lecturer basically said, well, yes, I, I, I believe it happened. But then I'm not doing anything with it, sort of thing. And Roger Carswell said, but well, don't you think that's intellectually dishonest? And the lecturer said, yeah, I suppose it is. And that was it. But we can be like, we can all be like that. And in a, in a, in a very real way, it's intellectually dishonest when there's such evidence to just deny it. And there is a wealth of evidence. The Christian message isn't just based on feelings and, and, and making sure you feel wonderful. It goes back to the objective. It goes back to the resurrection. 
The reality is, if Jesus really rose from the dead, we have the best faith in the world. And if he didn't, well, it's all fluff and nonsense. The willful unbelief of these leaders. Then I want us to move on. I want us to look at this. The power of a name. We've sung it in the songs, and it's been emphasized by, uh, by Helen in the children's talk. The power of a name. My next-door neighbor, uh, I, can't t- I shouldn't tell you his name, because if I do, you might do what I'm... My next-door neighbor, uh, an Asian fellow, he's really nice, and uh, he works as a, a manager in one of the local Halfords stores. And he's, he said to me on a number of occasions, he said, look, Martin, he says, just you pop into my store, mention my name and I'll make sure you get a good deal. So actually, on the last car that we had, we needed a new battery for the car. And I got it priced up and worked out how much it was. And then I went to his store, I mentioned his name, and, he, and uh, anyway, we got a good deal. Um, he can use his staff discount for friends as well, apparently. So uh, it felt quite pretty good to get a, a disc. I bought some things for the bike and one or two other things I didn't particularly need. Just because I thought, I've saved this much, I can... Anyway. The power of a name. Someone in authority is able to do something because of who they are. What's interesting here is in Acts chapter 4, verse 7, we're told about the power, or it leads on to tell us about the power of this name. Because the question that the Pharisees, sorry, the religious leaders have for... for, um, for Peter and John here is in verse 7, by what name or what power do you do this? They're asking, who gave you the authority to, to perform this miracle? Who gave you the authority then to speak in this way? By what name? It's very interesting because what happens here in Acts chapter 4 is virtually the same as what happens in Matthew 21 with Jesus. Virtually the same people ask Jesus virtually the same question. What authority have you got to do this? Now what's interesting is Peter. Peter points very clearly to Jesus. This is what he says in verse 10. It's straight, it's clear, it's absolutely no nonsense. Answering their question, by what name do you do this? He says this, then know this. You and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. You want to know? You want to know what name it is? Okay, it is the name Jesus that makes this man, that means this man is standing in front of you healed. Oh, and I'm going to add this little bit more. You murdered him. Oh, I'm just going to add this little bit more. God raised him from the dead. That's how this man is standing here. <laughs> I don't know about you, but Peter's answer is like, is like using a sledgehammer to crack a nut. I mean, instead of a little nutcracker that you struggle with and you, oh, there it breaks open. A sledgehammer, it obliterates the nut and everything. But that's what he does. He says, you want to know the name? It's the name of Jesus. You want to know a bit more? It was the Jesus that you crucified. You want to know a bit more? It was the Jesus that God endorsed and brought back from the dead. Peter reinforces that central point that he's making about the name of Jesus in verse 12 when he says these words. Salvation, rescue, is found in no no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. He carries on with this name. And he says, all right, you're you're looking for the answer. You're, You're asking me. You already know. And then he's telling these religious leaders who are relying on their own goodness and they're relying on their their Jewish sort of uh, culture and background and their their religious commitment. And he's saying to these people very directly, there's no one else but Jesus that actually rescues and puts things right. 
He's telling them clearly that what they've got and what they've invested their time and their energy and effort in is, is, is not going to work. Salvation, the rescue, has to be found in the name of Jesus. There is no other name. That's what he says. Because there is no one else in all of history who laid down his life and then took it back up again. Laid down his life and took it back up again. Because there is no one else in history who comes close to who Jesus is. God in flesh. And then they comes close to doing what Jesus did. Dying as a sacrifice for our wrong. For our rebellion. We have rejected God and pushed God away. We've decided that we do not want God in our lives so often. And yet God steps into the world to save and to rescue and to bring us back. And there is no one else that has done that except for Jesus Christ. Peter's words in verse 12 are true for us today. One day, I am going to be packed into a wooden box. One day, uh, uh, in, in some dusty solicitor's office, they're going to read my will out. Where will I be? I will be totally safe in the presence of God who rescued me because I invested at the age of 11. I placed my trust in the name of Jesus Christ. When we put our trust in the name of Jesus Christ, we are recognizing he died for me because he died for me and who he was that was dying for me. I don't have to face God's righteous anger and punishment. Instead, because of his good name, my bad name can be sorted and washed and cleaned. My trusting him gives me everything that is good that is attached to his name. When I first put my trust in the name of Jesus, that transaction took place. I was forgiven. I was made right with God. Let me show you this picture. Don't laugh. This is my security card from a long, long time ago. Yeah, that is me. All right? Good looking fella. All right? I was probably about 23, 24. So that's over almost 30 years ago. Almost 30 years ago. I worked for the Leicester Mercury for about nine, nine ten years. I, I really enjoyed the job. Um, but that was my security card. If I wanted to get into the building, I went in, I swiped that card, I pressed certain numbers, and I was in. If I wanted to go between departments, I swiped that card, I pressed certain numbers, and I was in. Uh, I had access to every single room in the Leicester Mercury apart from one. It was like the Holy of Holies. <laughs> it, was the, uh, it was the room in which all the servers were stored. And there was no dust or anything that meant to go in there, and, and they didn't want you to change the temperature of the room or anything, so you couldn't go in that room. I tried to go in one time. I think, oh, that card not working. And one of the fellas, because I was going in to see somebody, one of the fellas says, you can't come in here. And he had to talk to me through a piece of glass. It was like we were in quarantine. Oh, it feels similar, doesn't it? Anyway, but that card took me in. I remember forgetting that card one time, parking my car. I couldn't get in the building. I waited for somebody else to come. It was ages. When I did wait for somebody and somebody came, they didn't know who I was. So they said, I can't let you in. Well, it just... Yeah. When I've got the card, I'm in. Without the card, I wasn't in. I've still got the card now, but the building's sort of been kind of almost knocked down and sold out and changed rounds. In the name of Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness. We have access to God. We have the character of the Lord Jesus, his goodness, and everything attributed to, to us. So when we invest our trust in him, what we have in return is access into the very holy of holies, into the very presence of God. And there is no other name in heaven 
given amongst men, whereby we must be saved. We must use that name. We must take hold of that name. We must take of the promises from that name and not display the willful unbelief that these religious leaders had. So there's the power of a name, there's the willful unbelief, and then there's the final little thought, is the astonishing character of Peter in these verses. And uh, Kieran often gives us a challenge to do. I would ask you to do this. When you go away from here, maybe in tomorrow's quiet time or whatever, when you spend some time alone with God, I would ask you to read through these verses and just look at the astonishing character of Peter. I want to, you might find more, but I want to point out to you five things that were really astonishing about Peter. One, his courage. Two, the desire to make the most of every opportunity. Three, the similarity to Christ. Four, the loyalty he had to God. And five, the confidence he had in the gospel, the Christian message. Peter displayed these five characteristics through this passage. Let's look at them. Thirteen, courage. He was standing in front of the men that had killed his Lord, Jesus, and yet he wasn't afraid. This isn't the same Peter that ran scared from a servant girl just days before when she said, well, you're one of them. This isn't the same, Je- this isn't the same Peter. Why isn't it the same Peter? It's not just down to the fact that he'd been with Jesus. It was down to the fact that this Peter was now empowered by the Holy Spirit. Then secondly, he has the desire to make the most of every opportunity. He doesn't wimp out, does he? Would you have stood in front of these guys and said, okay, you want to know the name? It's the name of Jesus. Oh, that's the fellow you crucified. Would you have done that? I certainly wouldn't have wanted to do that. But with real courage, he does that. He takes every opportunity, even an opportunity in front of the people he knows are going to reject. He takes that opportunity. And then there's a similarity to Christ. And it's not necessarily something Peter points out, but it's the fact that religious leaders say, this man's been with Jesus. How is he like this? He has been with Jesus. And then there's a loyalty to God. Because in verse 19, they say, you've got to stop talking about this. And he says to them, basically, I can't stop talking about this. Because it's more important that I obey God than it is that I obey you. So there's this loyalty to God. And then add into that, he has an absolute confidence in the message that he is preaching. He preaches, you killed Jesus, but God raised him from the dead. There's no ifs or buts in there. It's dead straight. He preaches, you need to invest your trust in this same Jesus. He preaches it absolutely straight. As I look at Peter here, I think about, what about me? And then I want to ask you the question, what about you? Are you displaying the same courage? Have you got the desire to make the most of every opportunity? What people say of you? He, she, they've been with Jesus. Do you display a loyalty to God? Or at the first opportunity, you duck and dive and bob and weave? And wimp out. And do you have a confidence? And I worry that Christians are all over the place. I don't have a confidence in the gospel, in the message. Do you have a confidence in what the Bible says? There's a challenge there. And I honestly, I want you to go away and I want you to read these verses again and see the courage he has, see the desire that he has, see the loyalty that he has and the confidence he has. And I want you to look at it and say, am I like that? Elspeth pointed out a story to me. And it's one of those stories that says, this man's like that. It's in the the Ignite magazine about counties. Counties work, sort of do a little brochure that tells you what's going on. And it has a tribute to Tom Bathgate. I don't know if you've come across this. If If you're linked to in any way with counties. If not, you can borrow this copy. But it tells this story. Tom Bathgate was a counties worker for 61 years. So he faithfully just went round for 61 years and preached the message. Now he basically, he said, I'll read it to you. It says this. On a visit to a local, super, uh, a local shopping centre, 
Tom was approached by a lady selling cosmetics from a table in the mall. She asked, is there anyone special in your life? <laughs> now, this is what his wife says. He's got His wife says, in other words, he's not going to not going to not take this opportunity to tell you about somebody special in his life. So Tom said to her, yes, there is someone special in my life. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. To which the woman Maybe you've misunderstood me. <laughs> to which he says, no, I understand you perfectly. And I want to tell you about my special saviour. And when I tell you about my special saviour, then I'll tell you about a special lady in my life and maybe we can buy some cosmetics. <laughs> now, what's he doing? I know it's, it might sound corny and it might not work for everyone, but actually, he has such a love for God and such a desire to share this message that he just wants to pass it on. And then somebody comes and says to him, is there someone special in your life? And it's a no-brainer. He can't resist. Are we like that? Oh, you say, well, I'm not that sort of personality. I'm not. Well, find a way to do it with your personality. Find a way that suits you to do it. But when people look at us, do they see something courageous about us? Do they see that we, we just want to share the message with them? Do they see a similarity to Christ in us? Is there a loyalty to God that people notice? And is there a confidence? Now you may say, hold on. I'm not sure there always is. Well, can I just encourage you to spend time with Jesus? You do two, two, two things, really. One, repent. Say, sorry, God, I, I'm not like this, but I should be. I know I should be. And then just spend time with Jesus. Read the Bible. Find out what he was like. And in the same way that the disciples spent time with Jesus, and it rubbed off on them and changed them, it will do the same for you. Let me show you this picture. Hopefully it's the next picture up. Do you know what's going on there? Let me tell you what's happened. That telegraph pole was holding up those wires. But the bottom of the pole, it was set fire. Somebody set fire to it at some point, And it burned all the way up the pole to there. And the rest of the pole's gone. And what's left, it, and it looks like an optical illusion almost, doesn't it? What's left is just clinging on to the wires above. And I saw that picture, and it got me thinking. And this is what I thought. I, I, th I looked at that and I thought, that telegraph pole is now totally pointless. Isn't it? In fact, it's worse than totally pointless. It's weighing down the cables it's meant to be holding up. And I don't know why that picture stayed in my mind, but it did. And then as I thought about it, reading this passage and looking at these verses, I thought to myself, Christians can be like that. Totally pointless. Instead of holding up the truth that we have, presenting it to the world around, we just cling on in some way that almost drags it down. I worry that when we are Christians that are not courageous, that have no desire to share, that where there is no similarity to Christ, no loyalty to God and where we've lost the confidence that we should have in the message that we present, we are just like that. We're totally pointless. Worse. We're weighing down. What needs to happen there is somebody needs to sort of read, read well, that bit down and then put it on the post, don't they? When I read these verses, what challenged me is about halfway through the talk, uh, sorry, halfway through the preparation, I thought, I don't want to speak on this passage. And I suppose some of it was the weight of what was here. Some of it was the old devil getting in at you, discouraging and all the rest of it. But the, I, I, I prayed that through and I worked that through and I've, I just felt such wisdom was in the attitude of Peter here. And then if I can grasp some of what he has, the wisdom, the courage, the loyalty, 
then I'm going to make sure that I avoid being just something that weighs the rest of Christianity down, but actually something that holds up the message. Not that really the message needs any holding up. It stands up perfectly well by itself. If you get my meaning, it, it doesn't need us to present it. It's such power. What do we see in these verses then to close? We see willful unbelief of the leaders. What else do we see? We see the power of the name of Jesus. What else do we see? We see the astonishing character of Peter. What do I want you to take away from this morning? If you're a Christian, I would say look at these verses again. Look at the courage that Peter had. And try and get that courage back in your life. If you're not a Christian and you think, well, I don't know if I believe it or not, then I would ask you seriously to ponder very carefully the name, the name of Jesus Christ. Because there is no other name given amongst men that saves and rescues for eternity. There is only one Jesus who died in our place, taking our sin. There is only one Jesus who can offer us forgiveness making us right with God. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. No one else has done that to give me access to God. I'm going to pray now, and then after that, to close our service, there's a hymn that's going to play. Uh, again, focuses on the value and the worth of our Lord Jesus. As I pray, just share these words with me. Father God, I thank you for the name of the Lord Jesus. Because through his name, I can come to you, forgiven and right with you. Help me, Lord, I pray, to live a life that's as astonishing as Peter's was. Where with real courage, with real desire... I show a similarity to Christ and a loyalty to God. Help me to have complete confidence in this message that I have so that I can be someone who shares it with the world around. Amen. The words of the song say, Jesus, there's no one like you. There is no song we could sing to honour the weight of your glory. Let's just reflect on these words to close our service.